John Wycliffe was unrivaled in his time and has rightly been described by several commentators as one of the greatest reformers. His breadth of intellect, his firmness to stand for principle and his rediscovery of biblical ideas that had been lost for centuries sets him apart from his contemporaries. John Wycliffe lived over a hundred years before Luther, Zwingli, Calvin and the later English reformers, but he laid the groundwork and provided the foundation that paved the way for them. Standing alone as a voice calling for change, he was a reformer before the term became popular, advocating for a return to biblical literacy and a reform of the church. In the 14th century, Britain was plagued with poor roads, infighting between the English, Scots, Welsh and French, sickness, plagues and spiritual darkness. The issue of England's relation with the papal court was a hot topic as Parliament voted in 1366 to stop paying the 1,000 marks a year that had been agreed 150 years previous prior to the signing of Magna Carta by King John. England at the time was completely Catholic. There were no other denominations or religions that you could join. John Wycliffe was born in Hipswell, North Yorkshire, and then educated here in Oxford at Merton College. Later, he became a master at Balliol College in 1361, and over the next several years, he was responsible for various parishes while still holding a job here at the university. It was while he was here in Oxford that he came onto Rome's radar for denouncing the friars and their lazy lifestyle, and also he was the first in his era who used the term Antichrist in connection with Rome. There were several attempts by Rome to silence John Wycliffe, especially towards the end of his life in 1377, 1382 and 1383. Each time he was brought before various councils, but he was unflinching in his convictions. He was also protected by influential friends, but another key situation that helped him was the papal schism of 1378 onwards, where there was not one, but two rival popes, each claiming to be the right one. In the midst of this confusion and uncertainty, he was left to carry on his work with less hindrances. John Wycliffe also realized that he'll be far more effective if he trained other people, and he set about to train young men, known as the Lollards or Bible men, who traversed the whole country preaching the gospel. The greatest of Wycliffe's achievements came at the end of his life whilst he was here in the parish of Lutterworth and it was a translation of the Latin Vulgate Bible into the English language. Today it's hard to grasp the significance of this event because the Bible is freely available. But at the time it was against the law to own a copy of the Bible or even read it in the common language. Wycliffe's adversaries saw his translation as being dangerous in the English language and they described it as the gospel pearl is thrown before swine and trodden underfoot and that which used to be so dear to both clergy and laity has become a joke and this precious gem of the clergy has been turned into the sport of the laity. Wycliffe though declared plainly, Christ and his apostles taught the people in the language best known to them. It is certain that the truth of the Christian faith becomes more evident the more the faith is known. Therefore, the doctrine should not only be in Latin, but in the common tongue. Wycliffe's translation was not without fault, but now there was light where there had previously only been darkness. The light from his word pierced through the darkness and began to peel back the layers of night. The morning star that shines just before sunrise had arrived. Wycliffe died a few years after completing his translation and was buried nearby, but he was not left to rest in the ground. At the Council of Constance, Wycliffe was declared a heretic and a decree was made to dig up his bones and burn them to ashes. At first, the Bishop of Lincoln refused as he was a former friend of his and the next bishop delayed several years. After burning his bones to ashes, they were disposed of here in the River Swift. But in trying to insult and denigrate this fearless leader, they instead provided a beautiful illustration of the power of his work and the Word of God.
The River Swift flows into the River Avon, made famous by Stratford-upon-Avon. The River Avon flows into the Bristol Channel, and the Bristol Channel flows into the Atlantic Ocean. And so the impact of John Wycliffe's work and the translation of the Bible he made spread over the whole world. The flicker became a flame, and the flame became a fire, and the fire was unstoppable. The impact of John Wycliffe's life left a legacy far bigger than the short life that he lived. What type of legacy are you leaving behind? May it be one of principle, conviction, a love of God, and an unshakable desire to see the gospel spread in our lifetime. May we live a life where the influence spreads like these waters around the world.